All right, welcome. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to get a sense of who's in the room. So could you give me a show of hands if you work in public broadcasting? Okay, a lot of homies. <laughs> uh, if you were a media reformer, if you're a, a citizen journalist or an independent journalist, other categories? Academic. A academics, represent? All right. Union, people. <laughs> Union people, okay. Unite, great. Welcome. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about defunding of public broadcasting and how to save public media. That's not the conversation we're having today. We can talk about it if you want. But the conversation we're having today is about how to reinvent public media. And what I have here is a panelist of innovators. Um, everybody is working with new platforms and new networks, trying to get new audiences connected and new producers. So it's a very new, it's a shiny panel. <laughs> um, and uh, what we're really working towards is a much more integrated, multi-platform, public media network. And I'm going to show a little video about that. And then I'll introduce you to our panelists, and we'll get started. Some of us wonder what role public media plays in today's world. Doesn't the market provide all the information we could want? Well, not always. There are still some empty stalls in the marketplace of ideas. Sometimes, what's missing is credible and hard-won information about local government and community challenges. Sometimes, what's missing is a way to sift through different perspectives and connect citizens around common problems. That's where your public media should come in. Your media. Your platforms. Not beholden to shareholders or advertisers not vulnerable to commercial terms of service, just there to inform and engage you, to inspire you. What could public media be to you, and how could it connect you with your world? To see how this might work, let's imagine the Cardozo family. Jenna is married to Jose. They live in Cityville with their three kids, Liz, 10, and the twins, Max and Carla, who just turned 17. Like many of us, Jenna grew up on public broadcasting. We might even call it first-generation public media. Her local PBS channel offered Jenna programming that commercial media didn't. Kids shows, science coverage like Nova, her first exposure to dance, and thoughtful, critical news. Public media has changed a lot, along with the rest of the world. Jenna's next-gen public media delivers programming over all sorts of devices, and the local station is producing a lot more coverage of Cityville, working with local schools, community organizations, and other partners. Jenna's also accessing programs and apps produced by other outlets in other communities. There's no shortage of media available to Jenna, but there are still some kinds of content that Jenna can only get from public media. And there are ways that public media alone operates to help Jenna educate her kids and connect with her community. Jenna starts her day with public radio. She listens to a podcast on her mobile phone at the gym, the radio live in her car on the way to work, and streaming on her computer at work. A lot of the content comes from NPR, but a lot also comes from the local public radio station, which is the only radio station in Cityville that covers local and state issues seriously. The station also provides a platform for new content coming from startups in the area. Jenna trusts public media because of the producer's efforts to be fair and accurate. Jenna often shares stories with friends. Sometimes she's even a source for stories that deal with things she knows about. The Public Insight Network coordinates input from citizen experts to deepen reporting. So far, Jenna has contributed information about grocery shopping in the recession, her experience as a biologist with stem cell research, and commuting challenges. In other words, public media can catalyze and curate amateur content so that it's most useful to others. What the Cardozo family scenario shows is how the public broadcasting you grew up with can become part of a next-gen public media network 
still focused on high quality educational content, but also on local information and platforms for innovation. This is already happening in some places. Many public media institutions get it. They get that it's their job to provide well-told stories of interest to a diverse population, distribute them freely, and give people the tools to express their own perspectives. It is their job to help people convert raw information into real value in their lives. Making this happen more broadly, so that all Americans will have next-gen public media that works for them will require a sustained investment and coordination. It will take a shift to new networks, new infrastructure, new approaches to content, curation, and engagement to build on what has been and realize what could be. How do you imagine such a new public media network could best serve you? Many of us are now debating this question. Join the discussion. So, the question is, how do we get to that next generation public media? How do we build new networks? How do we reach new audiences? How do we create new distribution platforms? Uh, my name is Jessica Clark. I run a project called the Future Public Media Project at the Center for Social Media at American University. And I'm very excited to introduce you to my distinguished panel of innovators. Uh, we've got Sue Shart, the Executive Director of the Association of Independence in Radio. Jake Shapiro, the founding CEO of the Public Radio Exchange. Kay Shaw, the Director of the Public Media Corps, which is a project of the National Black Programming Consortium. Linda Fanton, did I say that right? <laughs> Director of Network Journalism and Innovation at the American Public Media. Sean McLaughlin, the Executive Director of Access Humboldt. And he also directs the Digital Redwoods Initiative. So we're going to start you off with Jake. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, anybody know, is the, is the government open or closed? I've been, I haven't been able to get online to, to check. Anybody know? Any updates? All right. When Jessica asked me to join the panel, um, one of the things she said we should try to talk about is a, a, a bit about the future of distribution, um, ways in which public media, even as it's uh, facing some existential threats in its current incarnation, might think about reinventing itself, um, which is a topic we've all been engaged in. In fact, it's kind of, we're in a funny moment because a lot of us um, have been trying to think in the last couple of years about how to rebuild, reform, rethink, reconstruct public media. And now it's sort of facing this cliff. Um, there's a bit of a tendency to just circle the wagons and defend the kind of incumbent structure as it has always uh, stood. Um, but there's also a real sense of opportunity in that this is accelerating a huge conversation about the meaning of public media. Um, the purpose of public broadcasting. Lots of people who never even thought about it um, are engaged in it. Unfortunately, a lot of them learning about it for the first time in a very, very negative way. But I think all of us here have an opportunity to help spell out a positive vision of what could be, um, even if the sort of um, tectonic plates of the, the old system might really shift dramatically. Um, PRX, Public Radio Exchange, was was born as a, as a digital version of a public media network. We were started um, back in 2003, we launched but the idea that um, we should really use the internet to, to build a new platform that would connect the purpose of public radio and public broadcasting um, with the tools of, of the digital network um, and with the idea of openness really at its root. Um, but ho honing in on what we think still is really the essential building block of public radio's success and its meaning, which is around delivering stories and around the emotional connection that people have with those stories and how those, um, when, when transmitted and connected to communities, really can have a, a big impact. Um, I think each of us are going to try to show bits of media so it doesn't just become a sort of set of diagrams and PowerPoints. So I'm going to start off with a clip. When you're a kid, you know, when daddy comes home, ah, oh, terror. My mother says, oh, hello, you're here. Everything that was me up in flames. He said, you don't know anything about picking pockets. I didn't know a fucking thing about dice and cards until you told me. So I was becoming the mental kid. And they're giving me their real jailhouse tough guy look. Did I shave my legs? Am I wearing good underwear? When should I tell him? When should I tell him? I was not doing it out of any great desire to help my fellow man. My father had never said anything like that before. And I'm like, spit it out, you motherfucker. Spit it out. You start getting humiliated. And I was like, oh shit. And then she turned and walked away. I went deaf. No, 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 no. The woman keeps looking at me and I keep looking at her. Closer and closer, 10 feet, 5 feet. The double doors just fly open. Whee! 
bop, 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 bop. I'm putting all the fucking wallets back. Don't you remember me? What? What? And then it finally dawns on me. I'm a black woman, and I'm in the home of a real life honest to God Klansman. And everyone just kept telling me how strong I was. We must hope and hope. He completely freed me. And hope. Don't make any sudden movements or you're going to blow it all. Till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates. Uh, so that's an excerpt from The Moth, which is uh, the Moth Radio Hour, uh, a program that PRX has been distributing. And for us, as an example, both of the new talent that's emerging in public radio and, and a great role that connects, in, in this instance, a whole set of live performances. This is a storytelling group based in New York, and they do them now around the country. With a digital uh, expression, they're a podcast which has been enormously successful. It's these one of those stories each week, um, now getting a couple million downloads a month. Um, and then a packaged radio hour that uh, just last week was uh, got a Peabody Award um, for really being an uh, excellent new program in public radio. Um, and we see it both sort of symbolically representing the open microphone that public radio should be representing and the excellence around creating stories that then really are telling um, a, a, about issues that are connecting with communities. Um, when we think of what PRX's uh, mission, we share really the, the broadest aspirations of public media when you look at the mission statements of any of the organizations in, in public broadcasting, they tend to have similar um, overarching commitments to inform societies. Um, shared stories inspiring to promote, improve lives and communities. For us, um, the way we go about that is uh, we harness technology. Um, this is really at the root of PRX. We're a small, we're sort of operated like a startup. We have software developers in our shop um, who are writing the code, which I think is really critical these days to actually have that at the heart of what you're doing in new media. Um, to enable a diverse range of talented creators and part of our insight was that um, the tools of creating media, of producing, recording stories were really being rapidly democratized, but connecting those rising talented people um, with the means of distribution, getting them on broadcast, which is still a really hard thing to get into, um, was, a, was a role that we could play. Engaged institutions, this is, we, we really still believe uh, firmly that local stations have an enormous role to play. Um, there's the, I think that's an interesting um, uh, undercurrent of a lot of the conversations happening um, here and, and elsewhere, which is what is that role of a broadcast local institution. Um, but the engaged part, the ones that are really feeling their mission and are locally significant and are going beyond just being a transmitter for national programs, um, we really think that there's a huge role that they can play and we're, we're very happy to be networked together with them, um, bringing significant stories to millions of people. Um, and the millions of people part is interesting too because I feel like one of the powerful things in public broadcasting is the broadcast. Um, even as we're all trying to navigate the niche media and the ways of reaching people on a, you know, four comments on a blog post, um, the power of broadcast and reaching millions of people is hugely important and public media actually has that as an asset. Um, we do all this through PRX.org, uh, which is the, the main um, open marketplace of PRX, which you're all invited to uh, sign up for for free. Um, create an account. You can um, create a producer account and begin uploading audio immediately. Um, essentially, it's an open marketplace where um, a couple hundred radio stations locally um, use it as a source of programs, and a couple thousand producers distribute through us. Um, and what's what's happened as a result of that is this interesting network map. Like we, do, we had the software guys in our shop like run a little analysis of what's happening on the marketplace, and this just shows this horizontal connection between those engaged institutions, those independent producers who are now sharing content through the PRX platform. Um, and the very size of the node, sizes of the nodes represent how active they are, how close they are to each other. Um, and for me, it reveals what I think is this latent real network potential for public media. When we think about what those connections mean, how you actually bring the institutions and the individuals together using technology, there's a huge power there that we're only beginning to really start to map together. <coughs> The way we approach content, I thought I'd sp speak a second about because I think it actually is common. I think it's, it's common to a lot of digital enterprises now um, where we see it as this three tiers. Um, on PRX, this is an open platform. Like YouTube, you know, you can upload anything. On PRX, you can upload anything. We're not pre-screening. There's not sort of a, you know, a application you have to fill out to get approved to be a producer. You just upload, which is a bit of a risk. And there's some things on there that we're, we don't think are that great. Um, but what we do is in the middle tier, we're curating. So 
that's what we do it both through edit editors, you know, the human editorial voice, someone sitting there listening, choosing, and featuring things on the homepage and promoting them to stations. We do it with machines, and this is where those algor algorithms kick in, or you know, searches that make sure that it's weighing how many times something has been licensed by a station, or how many times it's been reviewed, and that starts to bubble it up to the surface. Um, and then at the top of the pyramid is what we call signature programs, and that's where we as PureX starting to really feel what is working on the radio, what is connecting with audiences, and what um, the appetite at stations and, and the producer side is able to deliver, started to invest in things like the Moth Radio Hour that we feel um, are connecting all those dots. Um, and uh, you know the other programs are the State of the Reunion, which is a, a tremendous program, Snap Judgment, both of those are won the Public Radio Talent Quest, um, and Sound Opinions, which is from Chicago Public Radio. I should wind down shortly, so I'll just uh, finish with a quick snapshot of what distribution has started to look like. This is what every, everybody ends up having charts where they're the center and everything else is at the, at the margin. So you, you, know, you can basically, everybody should just walk around with them at the, at the middle. Um, but we have evolved. I mean, initially really it was that top bubble of local stations as the only, only path we were trying to reach audiences through. Um, but since it was born digital as a network, we've become a conduit to lots of other places that are reaching audiences. Um, obviously, podcasts have become popular. We do put stuff in the iTunes store for paid downloads. Um, the paid marketplace for content, I think, is an interesting debate in public media as to whether we should be pushing that or pulling away from it. Um, and then mobile applications, I'll just point out down on the right. Uh, you know, we and, and everybody else are trying to figure out how we can move over into the mobile space. We think in radio in particular, it's a huge opportunity because of how well these devices work both for listening to, engaging with audio, and submitting it and being interactive. You essentially now have reporters, potential reporters, all over your communities. And how can we connect um, stations, producers, and the people holding those phones? There's more to talk about, but I'll wrap up there so we can get through. So thanks. Thanks, Jake. So we're starting to kind of get a sense of what the national public media network might look like in this sort of digital first reality. Um, Kay Shaw from the Public Media Corps is going to talk a little bit about what a local network of institutions and partners might look like and how it might help to enrich public media and to bring in new audiences. Okay, well, again, good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about the Public Media Corps and it's a new public service model that we've been experimenting with in Washington, D.C. since uh, July of last year. It's modeled after the Teach, uh, Teach for America, and uh, in this project, what we do is we place tech-savvy fellows in public media and community-based institutions uh, located or serving underserved communities in Washington, in Washington D.C., in this case, for six months to develop and adapt uh, existing engagement models for connecting communities to public media. So we use technology, we use uh, very traditional uh, engagement activities, and looked at how you could be more effective in bringing those communities into public media. And um, the reason why we kind of like started focusing on this at this time is because uh, the National Black Programming Consortium has been looking at this issue of community engagement for a while since it created the uh, New Media Institute about five years ago, which was a professional development project for makers of color. So uh, we wanted to make sure that they were prepared to tell their stories in this really rapidly changing uh, media landscape that was influenced by these digital technologies. So, but we realized that there was a missing link in terms of you, you know, you, you produce all this content and it doesn't work like a field of dreams. If you produce it, they will come. So uh, how do you connect communities? How do you engage them? And particularly the communities that are underrepresented in the traditional public media landscape. So with the Connect for, uh, Connecting America National Broadband Plan, it presented an opportunity for us to pop, you know, explore these issues because it was looking at how to bring wire America and then also make sure that everyone in America was digitally literate. And so we applied and, uh, and we got a very good response, but no funding. But we decided to test the public media core on a smaller scale anyway because we thought we had something there. And we thought it was innovative and we thought that the stations could use that assistance in terms of um, capacity building, bringing in new audience and looking at new engagement models, but also really kind of uh, serve communities more effectively. So in doing that, we um, 
we launched the project in, in July. We had 16 fellows. We placed them in three wards with a high concentration of low-income African Americans and Latinos. They, they were our target communities. And uh, we had a very diverse range of partners. So because we didn't want to go in there with assumptions about this would work, that would work, we made everything as diverse as possible. We had um, the fellows were comprised of the folks who uh, lived in Washington, D.C. We didn't want anybody flying in from L.A., working in communities that they did not know. They uh, ranged in age, ethnicity, um, uh, experience. Some people were organizers, some people were journalists, some people were technology um, content makers. And then um, our partners were very diverse. They were community organizations, they, as you can see, um, schools, libraries, but all access points, points where the community intersected with, um, uh, uh, with institutions and um, probably a more, more effective way to interact with those communities. And we wanted to build a, a cohort among the fellows so that we are kind of creating an uh, ecosystem within this partnership so that they also support each other and interact and, and are networking and are collaborating on other kinds of activities. And um, because we didn't want to also make assumptions about you know, how connected communities were, uh, how they were using the technology, how engaged they were with public media, we also uh, spent three months collecting data. There was audits within communities, um, within organizations, but also a very intensive survey process that took place in the three wards where we were located, which were wards one, seven, and eight, which I'm sure means nothing to you in Boston. But um, uh, they were the highest concentration of African Americans and Latinos, um, low income. And uh, what we discovered was, yes, uh, there's a, a higher level of, uh, there were a higher percentage of folks who are not connected to um, the internet. And, um, and then there were quite a few people who were not watching public television or listening to public radio in those communities. So although you could assume that, we wanted to collect that data and just verify it. But it also kind of informed how we were going to engage this community. Because we couldn't go, you know, of course we had a lot of very dynamic young people out of college and they wanted to have mobile apps and all this technology. And we say, yeah, but how are you going to get them to use it? So, um, so we decided to have a combination of traditional methods as well as um, technology-driven methods. But everything that we did integrated new technologies so that although it might have been a town hall, you know, we had polling, it was streamlined, uh, you know, live. And so we try to integrate technology in every activity. <laughs> um, I wanted to give you an idea of one of the projects we created. And, and Jake, this is a lesson for you. We are not in the center of that circle. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> One of the, um, our, our partners was WHUT, uh, Howard University Television, which is the only te public television uh, license the, that is connected to uh, HBCU, which is historically black uh, college and university. And, and is located in a predominantly black city. And a lot of their content is all supplied by public uh, broadcasting. So you can imagine what it looks like. It looks just like it looks here. And um, there wasn't a lot of con local content and they wanted to really kind of like engage much more effectively with the surrounding community. And um, in particular, they wanted to target teenagers, which is not the easiest group to target. Um, it was very difficult to try to create something internally with them because of the way their structure was, so we decided to produce the show ourselves. So um, they were in looking at what we wanted to accomplish based on the goals of the PMC and what we learned from um, the data collection, the audits, uh, working with communities. We uh, wanted to make sure there was a connection, ongoing connection to them. With, um, for them with young people. So we established a relationship with high schools. We connected them to multicultural uh, organizations that catered to youth. And, and then also, believe it or not, they didn't have a very strong relationship with the student population at the university. So we tried to strengthen those ties. Then uh, with the youth population that we were working with in high schools, we actually trained them in digital media. And, um, and so they, they could produce content that not only would live on a website that, um, that was uh, created for the show, 
but also would be broadcasting the program. So to try to bring them to um, the, uh, you know, to the station, the viewing, become part of the viewing audience because they would see themselves. There was a constant feedback loop, you know, uh, particularly with young people, things change very rapidly. So not only, uh, so we, we, we did focus group through every stage of the process, uh, um, polling them and talking to them about what they wanted to see on TV, what issues um, were, were important to them, um, what their viewing habits were. Um, and then doing the production, showing them clips, getting feedback, um, bringing them into the audience so that they could see, they could be part of the, the, the process of making the, sh um, the show. Uh, all the high schools, we connected with about 10 high schools in Washington, D.C., and we would bring them in as part of the studio audience. So they would see how a show actually was produced. And they had never had young people in, in, in that facility prior to that time. So they, so, that it, so they could see it as part of the community. They didn't even know that WHUT, the only black public television station in the system that is connected to a black institution, um, they didn't even know it was in Washington, D.C. So it was like this awareness, but also this engagement with them. I want to show just a quick clip of the opening. And by the way, uh, the program is called What's Good DC, and it's going to be broadcast on WHUT starting in May. And we actually got six episodes produced. Yeah. I don't see that energy in this room. <laughs> How you feeling? <laughs> so as you can see, this is very much their show. Uh, you you want to go to the next slide real quickly? I just want to show uh, we, four projects came out of the um, public media core um, that we are developing into models for a toolkit. Uh, that we will be uh, that will be available online so that you can implement this we're teasing out all the issues in terms of developing this show and everything else we did and you will be able to replicate it and you can contact us if you need any assistance and to also continue this process of engagement you know it's not necessarily realistic to expect that we are going to be in every community across the country but people are doing exciting things and um, and want to collaborate more effectively with public um, uh, media, radio, and television, and in institutions like some of the uh, institutions that were represented here in this, on this panel. So we created this online uh, engagement uh, model called Kindred. It's, it's kind of like a dating service for public media, if you will. You basically go on and put your profile and then check out other people's profile. And then if you want to hook up and work on a project together, you can contact each other and make it work. Some of this will be facilitated by us, but also um, it allows you to see what their assets are, what their projects are, uh, how embedded in their communities they are, what other kinds of resources. And um, we, had, we launched it at South by Southwest uh, a month ago with a, a contest. Um, for the public media's next top model. So in addition to the four models that we develop out of the PMC, a fifth model will be added to the project and it's actually an interactive player um, that, uh, that one that's a collaboration with uh, uh, Mozilla. And it's, I think it's Web Made Movies Initiative. So um, of course I'll answer any questions and I have some copies of the, the toolkit to show you and an overview and some other goodies. And, um, but you can get all that later. <laughs> Uh, just to plug uh, our research center, uh, Center for Social Media has been incubating and following this project. So uh, check publicmediacore.org or futurepublicmedia.net to learn more. We're going to be um, publishing a report in the next month or so on the results of the beta test. And we've got a little bit of a AV transition here, so I thought I'd see if anybody has a question or two for our 
Our last two speakers. Yes, question. Hey, I'm just curious about what is considered the, the, the definition of digital literacy. What does that mean? I mean, I know what it means generally, but how does one classify it? The question was, what is the definition of digital literacy? <laughs> I think that um, clearly it varies because there are levels of literacy. But um, when we conducted our, um, uh, our, our survey, what we found is that, um, and when we went to communities, and by the way, we had the survey set up online as well as a paper survey. And what we found in some communities, people didn't want to use the computers that we had set up at our cool spots where we were collecting the surveys because they weren't comfortable with it because they didn't feel like they could actually do it. And, and so, uh, so uh, in the wards where we were, at a minimal level, you should be able to um, navigate the web. You should be able to you know, uh, use email. You should be able to do some of the, the really basic functions. Uh, turn on a computer. We had people who could not turn on a computer. So um, at a, uh, at, I would say that in terms of the National Broadband Plan, um, they wanted to make sure that people were connected to uh, broadband, but also knew how to do basic computer functions. And, um, and then there's another level where people receive training around certain, op uh, I'm sorry, operating systems, you know, for business purposes. So I'm going to turn this over. Okay. Sue Sharp, ready to go? I think we're as ready as we're going to be. Okay, Sue's going to tell us what it means to have a really powerful network of independent producers. Yeah, so I'm the executive director of a fantastic and very vibrant social and professional network of 800 media makers from across the United States, 44 states, and 12 countries around the world. We're 22 years old. We're based here in Boston. Are there any airsters? I know there are some. Stand up. Could you stand up? <laughs> Just want to say, so this is where it's happening, people. you got to talk to these guys right here. <laughs> really good to have you all here. Um, some, on, some up here, too. Um, so AIR is, yes, so what AIR, uh, we, what we basically do is we're, we're a membership organization. We, we attract members um, who are starting with public radio producers back 22 years ago, and we've expanded out in this fantastic way. And we're now comprised of not only NPR journalists, but also sound artists, uh, media activists. Uh, we have a lot of digital innovators. Um, you're going to see some of that work. Um, and uh, I'd love to talk to you about if you're interested in joining AIR and becoming part of this very, again, it's a giant brain trust. We provide training and mentoring and uh, uh, we deploy our talent out into the field. Um, insurance, things like that, things to cultivate and grow this uh, a terrific network. I'm going to talk today uh, for a few minutes about MQ2. How many are familiar with this project, MQ2? It was uh, AIR's, uh, it was the first uh, demonstration project uh, that AIR undertook to really uh, help lead, ha turn to producers to lead the way from public radio into a diversified trans-platform um, uh, public media, blending uh, traditional broadcast with digital platforms and digital tools. So we chose eight producers. We had a c competitive process. We chose eight producers. We gave them $40,000 each. We embedded them in the traditional broadcast uh, station and the networks. Four of them were at NPR. <clears throat> and we gave them just five months. And again, their assignment was to do this blending of the power of traditional broadcast with digital media. We have two of our MQ2 producers here. I want them to just quickly introduce them. Kara Oler, whose work I'm going to show you in a minute, and Lou Olkowski. Lou? Lou's, uh, Lou invented, the work that these uh, producers made was truly remarkable. Uh, these two and the six other producers. Lou invented a brand new format uh, for blending documentary, journalism, poetry, slideshow. What am I missing? What else what did you have in there? Um, bread making. Uh, <laughs> Zing. <laughs> Zing. Uh, and created this incredibly rich content uh, designed for mobile media and radio broadcast. It's called Inverse, and you can see some of her work on uh, Vimeo, if you Google Inverse. 
Um, I particularly like women of Troy. Um, but since this is a panel about the future, I thought I would spend my time showing you the trajectory of one of our, one of our projects that is truly uh, incredible and is going to, you're going to get, I think, one of the first public, is that right, looks at this project um, that's really defining and going to define uh, public media. So, so we're, we're doing, doing a lot of talking, talking today about, about public media. media. Let's, Let's take, take a few minutes to actually boost the audio? experience it. Mapping, Mapping Main Street is a standout MQ2 project. It's a unique collaboration between Peabody Award-winning independent producers Anne Hepperman and Kara Oler, Harvard economist James Burns, and media artist Jesse Shapens. I'm here on Main Street in the city metro diner. We are in Lexington, Virginia. Lucia, Montana. In Minnesota. Hill of Bend, Arizona, all Main Street. When you think they live on Main Street, you think of all the little shops, Fourth of July parades, ice cream vendor on the corner. You picture in your mind a place. Our particular Main Street connects United States and Mexico. It's a bunch of hoes and drug dealers. That's all I know about Main Street. Good place to start a business. It's a true small town community spirit. Ain't much. You can see as far as it goes right there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kara Oler, one of the creators of Mapping Main Street. Anne Hepperman and I produced three stories for NPR's Weekend Edition. And with each broadcast, we reached an estimated audience of 1.2 million listeners. Our stories were featured on NPR.org and on NPR's Facebook page, generating hundreds of comments. I think one of the most unique aspects about our work is the participatory platform we created. It's powered entirely by public APIs, that is, existing open content sites. The stories are streamed from NPR, and we also invited citizens to upload photos and videos to Flickr and Vimeo. All of these contributions automatically appear on our site, allowing us to see Main Streets through the eyes of those actually living there. The life of the project has extended far beyond the NPR broadcasts, a life that has had little intervention by any of us working behind the scenes. It's been amazing to see how citizens are using this project as a powerful means to engage local communities. Some have collected oral histories, and others have used it to get to know towns in their area, places they may drive by every day, but never stop. And some of the biggest adopters have been educators, they see Mapping Main Street as a great way to teach young people about media, technology, and their own neighborhoods. WNYC's radio rookies use Mapping Main Street as a framework for a youth media project. Now we're all seniors at the East West School of International Studies, a school just off of Main Street in Flushing, Queens. Now we're walking to Main Street. Yay. We hang out a lot on Main Street since that's where everything is. It's really crowded, noisy, and sometimes smelly. Well, it's not all that bad. There's a big glass library, the post office, the Long Island Railroad, Queens Crossing, businesses, and tons and tons of places that sell J-pop, K-pop, Hello Kitty stuff, bubble tea, all things Asian. Yeah! More than 7,000 photos and videos have been contributed from nearly 600 main streets across the country so far. A great start, and there's so much more ahead. And so... Mapping Main Street continues to live in, uh, in the, it's kind of an incredible viral phenomenon. The last uh, NPR broadcast was months ago. And the project continues, the platform continues to engage educators and others from across uh, the, the country, mapping Main Street, experiencing their own uh, Main Streets. And that's been one of the most re remarkable aspects of the project. So what I want to do here now is just focus briefly on the pathway that these MQ2 producers have taken since this project. Um, they st first of all, st they're also based here in uh, Boston. They started a new nonprofit called Media, uh, Media and Place Productions. And they, they're continuing to develop out their work uh, 
pushing the boundaries, really, of storytelling, um, using media with public spirit mindedness um, in innovative new ways. And this latest creation um, sort of grew out of the guts, the infrastructure that they conceived and built uh, this back end of, of for ma mapping Main Street. And it's something that they call Ziga. It's a new platform for journalists. Um, it's I think maybe you're getting the first public look at it, and you, you heard it here first, Ziga. Uh, it's an open source HTML5 platform uh, that will allow collaborative production, curation, and publication of immersive multimedia projects on the web, on tablet, on mobile devices. Ziga enables people without any programming knowledge or experience but also those with experience, um, to create projects like Mapping Main Street. They're sort of exporting, again, this infrastructure and this architecture. Um, and so far, um, they've got it set up so that the users of Ziga can incorporate streams, um, edit and use media from Flickr. They've got YouTube feeding into it. They've got content from NPR, SoundCloud, the YouTube of sound, archive.org, audio, pictures, video, very sound and content rich site, and Google Maps. And again, this is all done through these public APIs that they have created and built this architecture. Um, they're also in the process of uh, creating iPhone and Android applications uh, so listeners can easily contribute and geolocate images audio and video um, from their mobile devices, load them right up um, to any Ziga project. So it's really um, this platform, it's in its very early stages, really in an alpha stage here, but it really gives us a glimpse, uh, if you turn your imagination to what's possible here, into this new space of a truly integrated, truly participatory, digital, digital um, and very rich uh, public media. Kara's here. Right, again, there's Kara if you're interested in finding out more about uh, Ziga or the work that she's doing with her collaborators. Um, AIR is going to be launching later this year uh, another round of our MQ2 projects. And so what we learned in our first round was what happens obviously when you turn to producers and they make stuff, like incredible stuff. And you give them an assignment and what AIR does is we basically act as the mediator. We identify the talent, and then we create a space where it's a, it, it's, it's a space that is a very fine balance of giving producers resources, um, support, but also flexibility and freedom to experiment, but within a kind of a disciplined framework. And this is what we've uh, become experts at. Uh, the next round will be focused on uh, hyper-local communities. We're going to incubate producers, this time at local stations, with the idea that we're going to try to get public media outside and even further into the streets to engage citizens and to tell the stories that are not being heard and not being told on public media, to really reflect a broader, a broader face of America. So that's uh, later this year. If you all want to find out more, we low. Uh, Lo is here, Lo Audley. Uh, you can talk to Kara. You can talk to Lou Alkowski. Talk to me. We're at table 402. Um, and you can visit us, airmedia.org. We'd love to have you with us. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. I can't wait to get my hand on that Ziga. That <laughs> looks awesome. <laughs> Linda, do you want to come up? Or? So we're starting to see some threads here. What does it mean to have networked public media? It means that users, independent producers, community organizations are all empowered to serve new roles. And we, uh, we, we saw a little preview of the Public Insight Network, which Linda's going to talk about in the video. Um, and that's giving uh, users new access to newsrooms in new ways. So hi, everybody. I'm Linda. I'm not Joaquin. I'm not going to speak about the semantic web or I don't know a whole lot about net neutrality or um, the broadband access in rural communities. 
Um, but I can speak from experience as an editor of small newspapers in rural America and as a reporter um, for, for many years who um, dealt with the challenges of and the rewards of finding authentic voices and stories to tell. So this idea of finding authentic voices and stories is something that we hear a lot about and we talk a lot about and it's why Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media created the Public Insight Network in the first place. And um, in a nutshell, it's just a pipeline um, for everyday people to share their expertise and their insights to help enrich reporting, make it more accurate and relevant, and also to help journalists um, build connections with their communities. And we are, it's being used today in small public radio stations like New Hampshire Public Radio and WDET, small little investigative startups like The Lens in New Orleans, and also in large public media and commercial media outlets like um, WNYC, uh, WLRN in Miami, the Miami Herald, the Washington Post is uh, uh, figuring out how to adapt it to, to some of what they're trying to do. And um, so it's kind of gotten a reputation as the BFR, the big fun Rolodex um, out there. And it is, I mean, with 102,000 people around the country who signed up to be sources for journalists, it's, it is a really robust Rolodex. You can really find knowledgeable sources on deadline. And that utility is really valuable to journalists who are kind of caught in a cycle of reactionary journalism and really somewhat um, restricted in their uh, ability to really get out and, and talk to a lot of different people and get different points of view. But beyond the Rolodex, Public Insight has really uh, morphed into a, a platform for increasing credibility and um, in addition, uh, credibility but also transparency and some of the other things that we're really striving in public media and we hold those things pretty dear. Um, so there's some research to back all of this up which we're really happy about. Um, Doreen Marcioni is a, a longtime print journalist and she um, is a PhD from, from Mizzou and has been doing some research around conversational journalism and collaborative journalism. And she's found that stories that are produced with real voices from real people that take, uh, you know, provide the context and the human nature of a story rank higher on the credibility scale than those that are told with authoritative voices and those of the so-called experts. But also also within that realm of collaborative journalism, those stories that are told in sort of the PIN model where um, you're bringing everyday people and their voices are part of this rank higher on the credibility model than those told with sources from Twitter or those more wiki news models where people are kind of editing the story as it goes. Um, and part of her research really found that some of the driving factors around this um, are the, the ability for uh, the the reader and the listener and to kind of identify with the journalist a little bit. Um, and so the more transparent we are as reporters about how we're doing what we do and letting people know a little bit about us personally is a key driver in this idea of credibility. And in my own experience, um, you know, I, I look back when I think about this and I think about Betty. And when I was an editor of a small weekly newspaper in Wyoming, um, the Pinedale Roundup, I used to rely on an army, if you will, of stringers in small communities. We were the only newspaper in a rather large county in, in Wyoming. And I relied on people like Betty to cover the town council meeting and to write up stories. And it was fairly early on in my career there and I got a story from Betty and it was basically um, said that 50 people showed up for the swearing in of the mayor and the town clerk was fired in that order. So I, I called Betty and uh, was going to tell her that I was going to you know, flip the order of those two things and wanted to know a few more details about the firing of the town clerk and she said well um, I don't, I don't have a lot of details on, on that um, because my, or you know, she told me some things but then she couldn't answer all my questions and she said, well I wasn't actually at the meeting. I sent my 18 year old son, he's been covering the meetings for a couple months because I'm on bed rest and she was, you know, eight months pregnant. And um, I was mortified, you know, I was thinking, well, you're writing stories with the notes from somebody else. <laughs> and, um, but when I think about it, you know, the community wasn't mortified. Nobody from the community was complaining that, um, that Betty's son was the one, you know, covering the meetings and gathering notes and she would write it up. And, you know, I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, it's okay, he's an Eagle Scout. 
<laughs> but think about that. I mean, you know, the, the people saw in Betty and her son a little reflection of themselves. And that had some credibility, probably more credibility that as a reporter, me going in there, an outsider, and, and documenting and talking to people, I wouldn't have had as much credibility. And so I think that's a, you know, an important thing to, to think about, that it's uh, really, about, really about relevance and it's about credibility. And it's also that those things are earned. They're not just automatically given to you because you have a badge that says you're a member of the press. Um, so over the years, we've collected, I mean, we've been doing public insight for eight years now at American Public Media, and um, we've collected an incredible amount of data about people. In fact, we probably have the largest database in the world that really is fueling um, collaborative journalism and, and um, public media. And this gives us an enormous opportunity, really, to understand people. And, um, I think, though, to understand people, you have to come out from that veil of authority that we sort of hide behind in some ways as reporters, and you, you have to knock on doors. And that takes a certain amount of courage. I can remember very distinctly um, August 9th, 1998. I'm a reporter. I commit to Saturday. So Saturday assignments are cat show, you know, mayor press conference, whatever. And that day I was, I had two assignments on tap. I was to cover the jazz dancer tryouts and, uh, and, and to go up to uh, LDS hospital where a young girl had received surgery courtesy of the Operation Smile uh, nonprofit. So there was, uh, you know, I had those two assignments. I went and I reported on that. I came back to the office. My editor says, scrap it. I want you to go to West Valley City and I want you to get the neighborhood reaxed to what had happened the day earlier, which was that um, in the middle of a really hot afternoon in West Valley City, five little girls, all under the age of six, climbed into the trunk of their mother's car and died of heat stroke. And I begged her, don't send me. I can't, th this is the worst of journalism. We're vultures, we're not welcome there, people don't want to talk to us, don't assume we, do, we have a right to know what they're feeling and what they're grieving, please don't send me. She said, get out there. So I circled the block for an hour and I was just going to go back and lie and say nobody would talk to me. But something compelled me to park my car and knock on a door. And the first door I knocked on was a woman who was actually with the mom as they drove in the car around the neighborhood looking for the little girls and then opened the trunk. And I never took my notebook out of my back pocket. I just talked to her and we cried and I left and I walked across the street to a cul-de-sac and I started knocking on doors and everyone wanted to talk to me. They needed to talk to me. They needed a safe place to tell their story. They needed a way to communicate with their neighbors the anguish and the grief that they were feeling but they felt like anything they might say directly to this family would just sort of widen the wound. And so I think that that's a really important thing for us to remember that people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And that's something that as journalists, when we're really truly listening to people's stories, um, you know, that's, that's a way to do it. But, you know, that comes through engagement. It comes through listening. It also comes through um, a mindset and a platform and making those connections. And that is what we think public media really needs to aspire to, and it's why we created the Public Insight Network. So, PIN is a way to, for people to invite us or allow us into their living rooms. But as journalists, we need to go where we're not invited. I mean, this is important. This is important to transparency and accountability. And, um, and you know, it requires a certain tenaciousness um, or maybe just um, naivety. And I can uh, tell you a story about when I I, I spent three years covering uh, the Olympic bribery scandal. And I was in Sydney in the Olympics, and of course, by this time, Mitt Romney had supposedly cleaned up the Olympics and was charging board members a dollar a slice of pizza, and there wasn't going to be any more gifts to Olympic officials, no more hoity-toity parties, you know, no more scholarships for their grandchildren. But I find out in Sydney that there's a hoity-toity party going on hosted by the Salt Lake Olympic Committee, and I said, you know, I need to find out what's going on there. And I, you know, kind of, I don't know how I faked my way through the security guard. I think I was pretending I was talking on my cell phone. And I get up to the party and they won't let me in. I meet Verena Rasmussen, she's the head of protocol. She's not letting me in. 
So I said, well, you better get you know, your PR person here because I'm going to write a story about why you're not letting me in and you're supposed to be transparent. And she comes and she says, oh, let her in. And so Carolyn tells me later, the reason I, they weren't going to let me in is because I was wearing open-toed shoes. <laughs> And, and I think, and, and you know, the point here is that, you know, access is getting, uh, it's getting worse for journalists. I mean, we're all in some ways kind of just people with open-toed shoes. We don't have, you know, government officials and our sources can talk directly to their audiences. They don't need us as much anymore as journalists. And so we're, you know, I was just talking to um, a reporter friend of mine the other day from the Seattle Times, and he covers the environment, and has done it for 11 years. and. Um, he said, the flax from the EPA won't even return my phone calls. And that was for a story he was working on about radiation contamination in milk in Spokane as a result of the nuclear crisis in Japan. And so we need to use technology and all the tools at our resources to basically find new, act, new experts, new access to information, not relying on the public relations officials and the politicians and the people who've got the access game figured out to us. This is incumbent upon us. It's incumbent upon public media. It's part of our role. And that, you know, it isn't just about using the public insight network. It's about using um, technology, uh, texting, you know, mobile devices, you know, many of the, you know, things that you've been hearing about here and you're going to hear about all throughout this conference. Um, and it's about reaching those new audiences as well and letting, bringing their stories to light and, and you know, bringing the attention, those attention to the journalists and the community as well. The, I, I want to, uh, you know, kind of bring this back around to the idea of the role of public media and public institutions. And I see many of you here um, but was attended a, a two-day conference just on the front end of this called uh, Biblio News, which is really about bringing journalists and librarians together to think about our common mission in terms of identifying and fulfilling information needs about communities. And People talked a lot about um, how libraries went through their crisis about 25 years ago due to you know, the digital revolution as well as budget crises, and they really reinvented themselves as being about engagement first and content second. And I'm not suggesting that public media or media in general should be simply about engagement or engagement for engagement's sake. I think we do have to put the, the source more at the center of what we're doing. That, that idea of being more transparent about what we're doing, too, is really important. And I just want to wrap up with one story. Um, some reporters at uh, SCPR, Southern California Public Radio, which is an APM-owned um, radio station that uses public insight in their reporting, um, were curious to find out about health conditions in prisons. And this was coming on the heels of a, a, a really bloody riot at the uh, Chino Men's Prison Facility in California. But the Public Insight journalist said, you know, instead of just going in and asking questions about health conditions, let's think a little bro broader. Let's ask people what their experience is with the prison system. And maybe we'll, you know, see what we find. And so she, we don't have a lot of prisoners in the Public Insight Network. Um, so she just used the mindset of Public Insight to basically take one of our queries or online interviews and post that URL where people were already having conversations about this. So utilizing other social media to get the, where people were already paying attention to this issue and get them to answer a few of our questions. And through that, she met Charlene Padilla. And Charlene's son was imprisoned at Chino. And he'd been writing her letters since the riot, telling her about the conditions leading up to the riot and after. And it involved things like holding prisoners in outside outdoor cages in their underwear in 105 degree heat for four days at a time. And it was just, you know, really a uh, shocking stuff. And so the reporter started to dig a little more and talk to a few more people. Charlene took the, and one of these online interviews printed it out, took it into the prison, had her son distribute it to prisoners, um, and then fill it out, who filled it out, and came back and provided that information to the reporter. So technology works, but it isn't always the best method. Sometimes having that person in the community, giving them a safe place and a pipeline to tell their story. This turned into an amazing three-part series that has won all kinds of Golden Mike Awards and everything. But the best part about it is that that the Society for Professional Journalists honored Charlene 
with their Sunshine Award for basically <coughs> advancing transparency and accountability in government. And um, so I just want us to think about that, not only at this conference, I mean, we have a lot of really interesting, and you know, you have a lot of interesting things to say about the future of media and um, as we talk about transparency and curiosity and technology and reaching new audiences. But it's also important that we listen to the public and not just each other. And our experience with the Public Insight Network is that people are more than eager to share what they know. So thanks. No, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Linda. So at the Center for Social Media, Pat, can you raise your hand? Pat, after Heidi and I define uh, public media as media for public knowledge and action. And what you need for public knowledge and action, for people to act as empowered citizens, you need not just content, but access and training to allow people to express themselves and get them into the larger public sphere. So Sean is going to talk a little bit about how community media is helping people do that in some innovative ways, and, um, and a little bit about how policy questions tie to that activity. Aloha, I'm Sean McLaughlin, uh, Access Humble. I'm going to talk a little bit about broadband media, and I guess I, I need to start off by saying I love pub casting <laughs> and the legacy of public media, and you, that's the main thing that I consume, quite honestly. But I also, uh, I'm going to make some potentially incendiary and politically incorrect yeah. remarks, so I have to <laughs> preface my remarks with that. We are at the National Conference for Media Reform, after all. So um, uh, let me just run through. I, I didn't really have a fancy slideshow. I'm sure I have the smallest budget of anybody here. But where I'm from is uh, Humboldt County, California. It's in the northwest corner. And uh, uh, the, so you see where we are. It's a very large area. It's a six-hour drive from San Francisco to the middle of Humboldt County. So we're, very, we're quite remote. The little inset map there, the green, shows you the former uh, range of the redwoods, coastal redwood trees. There's the little red spots within that, which are the remaining redwood forests, uh, most of which, most of the remaining redwoods are in Humboldt County, Redwood National Park and State Parks. So if you're interested in visiting redwoods, give me a call. I'll be happy to show you around. Um, that's where we are. And we're very place-based. And we do have pubcasting and legacy public media uh, in the form of, and I, my, my favorite, Kide, which is a Hoopa tribe-owned radio station. And I have to uh, recognize my friend Joseph Orozco, who's here, the station, general manager of that station, one of the founders of that station. Um, Really remarkable accomplishment. We also have a re really more traditional NPR station at Humboldt State University, KHSU. We have uh, a low power FM at a charter high school uh, called Blue Ox, KKDS. We have one public broadcasting television station that serves the, the wider region and surrounding counties. We also have another uh, long standing and somewhat infamous community radio station called KMUD, KMUD. Uh, uh, which I'll tell you a real quick story when I was first, I'm, I'm only five years in this area, so I, I talk about it as a newcomer. Uh, but when I was driving up to the job interview I, from San Francisco, I tuned into KMUD Radio and I heard uh, talk about local, serving your local community, there was the Civil Rights Report, which tells you where the enforcement agents are looking for pot grows right now. <laughs> they're driving up this road right now and they're, the helicopter's going there and it, talk about community service. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a different kind, but uh, oops. Um, I, I guess I, I, forgot to, I forgot to point out, but you see on the map, um, we're not in the center of anything. We're, we're living on the edge. <laughs> this, the, the, our, our geography really is the edge. We will be likely um, very close to the next, or, or a very large disaster. We, we live on fault lines. We prepare for this. Uh, we recognize that we, we literally are living on the edge, both geologically, geographically, and in lots of other ways. Very remote place to be. So we sort of think about these things a little differently. And I think one thing that you got to think about, this panel is about innovation. I'm sure a lot of my colleagues sort of recognize innovation means really being willing to fail. If you're not taking a chance, you're not really innovating if you haven't taken that kind of a chance. So uh, what we're seeing here are the uh, relatively successful examples, but I'm sure my colleagues have all had some failure, and that's it's why it's also known as the bleeding edge. Uh, the leading edge also bleeds. 
I'm interested in hearing about hyper local, you know, uh, things. And um, it reminds me of when I visited Portland. I went, and I, I love uh, micro brews, and I found a, a, a nano brewery which is basically smaller than a microbrewery, right? It's like they do it in buckets in the back and they bring them out for you. And so I started thinking, well, hyper-local to traditional pubcasting is, is not like it is for community access people like me. I come from community access uh, television. So I guess we're ultra-local, I, I don't know. But um, I think there's also very, a really philosophic difference, which is because coming from community access television, um, we think of, uh, honestly, and I have to overcome this bias, but I think of uh, pub, pubcasting as, or public you know, broadcasting in the traditional sense as gatekeepers. I would love to have my stuff out there, <laughs> but there's a gatekeeper there, and that's why, and that you've had to overcome this, and a lot of your excitement, I think, is finding ways that you're overcoming that or, or evolving out of that. Well, I, well, access is gate crashers, so we're, we're here to help you, because <laughs> we, we know how to do that. And uh, with, with, with due respect to my, my, my friend Joseph and also Loris Taylor, who is a great uh, leader in uh, Native Public Media at, at the organization Native Public Media, as a community access person hearing all this great stuff that I love hearing, it's almost like hearing the reports back from Columbus discovering America. You know, it's like, hey, there's real communities out there, you know? <laughs> Well, we've been discovered. Community, communities' voices have been discovered by public media. And it's kind of this strange sense of, well, welcome, but please recognize there were people here when you got here <laughs> and who've been doing this work for decades. <laughs> and uh, it's very exciting and quaint to visit the, the natives on the, in the community, but the, uh, they actually have voices already, and they've been doing a lot of this work. So uh, there's a little bit of a hurt feeling and a, a little uh, sort of sense of caution about the arrival of these newcomers into our community media spaces, uh, as you can imagine. And uh, like I said, the, hi the history sort of tells us that. So anyway, now that I got that off my chest a little bit, uh, let me say that uh, we're all in the same boat, really, and we're trying to figure out what's the future going to look like for us. And as Jessica mentioned, uh, those of us who've been working in the ground in communities see that access to infrastructure, access to the tools to have your own voice, uh, you cannot come and deliver my ability to have a voice. You can empower me to have my own voice, but you can't deliver my voice to me. And so I think this is the dynamic that we see is you need to have the tools and the infrastructure. So we started looking in our work at community access television for uh, in Humboldt County as, well, it's great if we can deliver all these things on new platforms, but we also have to, in, in a really remote rural communities like ours, you have to deliver the platform. Uh, you have to make sure people have access to broadband. Uh, you're not gonna get all this fancy, cool new stuff if you don't have that kind of access. So we started developing community broadband as a, as in relation to media access. So media access, community broadband, really as a integrated uh, sort of approach. And we, 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 we love the concept of media ecosystems. And since we have a relatively sustainable, uh, w w and in respect to the redwoods that we live in with, uh, we sort of mapped onto that ecosystem our concept, some of our concepts. And so we talk, we, we talk about it as we're developing really wireless assets for mobile capacity. Uh, so, and, and this, uh, if you think about it from a policy, and I'm going to start sort of segueing into more of my policy spiel here, which is Spectrum has had a very different regulatory regime. The broadcast world, you were hobbled by the fact that you could only deliver one way for the longest time. So it really is kind of cool and new that you can hear back from people now, because that wasn't part of the broadcast model. It's a one-way model. But uh, Spectrum is, is regulated and managed and mostly at the federal level. You don't have a lot of say and there's not much you can do locally. There's some unlicensed Spectrum and there's some great innovations happening in unlicensed Spectrum area. But if you have to have a broadcast license, I heard a couple of F words in one of your things and I'm thinking that probably didn't air on any public radio station. But it, could, it aired on access channels or it could air on access channels. So we, we, we also have a little different world that way. Uh, but Spectrum, and wireless assets to us, we feel like, connect us in the same way that a canopy overhead connects us. And it delivers a certain and connects us in a way that's quite different 
than the connections that we have on the ground with, with fiber networks and cable networks and wireline networks, which are the old telephone cable uh, networks that connect us. So when we look at developing our infrastructure, we looked at we really need a healthy root system as well as a healthy canopy. We, it's not either we need a fiber connection or a wireless connection. We need it all, and we need it all to work together and to be integrated. And so we looked at the broadband plan and what's happening with the federal policy and driving this conversation forward. And there was a lot of discussion, particularly in round two, when they renamed the, uh, the uh, deployment funds comprehensive community infrastructure. And a big focus of that was connecting community anchor institutions. And when you look at really dispersed remote communities, sometimes that fire station or that Grange Hall or that library is the only, uh, is the only place that has a connection, that will get a connection on, with, with a fast broadband connection. I deal with the little town of Oric in the, up, on the nor up on the north coast. It's population 300. It's right on the coast, a little fishing uh, logging town. And you can't get broadband there. It's not available. You can get satellite with uh, latency issues that it doesn't really work. But so connecting those anchors is a way that you get that community connected. Public media which includes all of us, <laughs> is a community anchor institution. And I think we need to look at making ourselves very connected locations and then sharing those connections out. And uh, so in the public side of that equation, media, uh, nonprofit sector, and others uh, get connected. Uh, we also look at schools, libraries, universities, colleges. There are a lot of connections that exist that aren't shared or aren't accessible. If we can open up and connect these connections, we'll be much happier and better off. And uh, we do a lot of work with government. One thing about community access television is it's, it comes from local jurisdiction. Local governments require this when they can, when the policy allows it. We're up against it in terms of federal policy. But we, we, we also serve public safety purpose. I mentioned the disaster scenarios for us because we plan our communication assets to be capable to serve us in that scenario, not just when we're comfortable and want to have nice high thoughts, which we love to do, but also to be prepared for when we will be essential, when you cannot live without that connection. It's going to tell you where you can go, where you can't go, where you get water you can drink, uh, which bridges are down, so forth, and public health is also a big issue. So it's hard to sort of summarize this integration of broadband, community broadband and media access, but you see that there's a frame provided in the, in the, in the uh, broadband plan in the national policy, comprehensive community infrastructure, which serves all of these institutions, public education, government, and I think my, my appeal to, to all of us is that we think of ourselves as community anchors at, in terms of approaching that, the broadband infrastructure and developing it in a way that is accessible and gets everybody uh, the ability to, to, to connect and do this really without needing our tools. I mean, uh, I, I, go back to, I go back to where I started, which is I'm, I'm, I, I wish I didn't have to talk because I'd rather just be interviewing all of you about how I can rip off your ideas and use them in my community. And I, I love the fact that they're all open source. Anyway, here's my contact info. and. Uh, uh, my nifty new QR code, which I'm excited to learn about. Um, Thank you, Sean. Okay. All right, so Sean brought it all the way around for us. We can now see how the future of public media is connected with the policy issues that this conference is dealing with. We can see there's a lot of excitement and maybe a little bit of, hey, we were here first. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're inviting you to join this discussion with us. Go ahead. I believe I heard that Gaddafi shut down the internet. Can that happen here? <laughs> That's a good question and it's a complicated one. Does anyone on the panel want to address it? Yeah, Sean's got an answer for us. I just want to say Gaddafi cannot shut down our internet. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> uh, but the bad news is the gatekeepers can and this is why open internet and net neutrality is such a critical issue for our community and I just want to make that point that it's really a, for us to be able to do this kind of work if we don't have an open internet, if we don't have net neutrality, uh, then this will all be corporate logos and if it's not sponsored you won't have access to it. We have a question here that I'm trying to get to for Jake about the moth. And yes, we did have to um, bleep out a lot of those words for the moth radio hour. In fact, that has been a real problem. 
um, as we've been trying to create much more open content for radio, there's a lot of it that, that um, runs into those issues. A question about, um, you mentioned broadcasting. It just can't be one way, that it needs to be two way. I have a website that I do environmental stuff, rochesterenvironment.com, and having a two way would be scary. Feedback is usually nonsense. Um, our major newspaper, to get any of the feedback, they don't screen it at all. It's, they, people carry on nonsense conversations between themselves. They don't address the issue whatsoever. And to, and to be able to have a screener in your media, to be able to screen everything, is very time consuming. Is there a way where you can, is there a better way to provide that kind of broadcasting that's two-way where you don't have to deal with the nonsense or less of it? Do you have answers, or I have well, This is Linda. Um, Whoa. <laughs> well, I think the government just shut down. If your question is that you know, just how do we how do we um, create more civil and civic conversation, um, you know, via the web or on the internet, I can say that. Um, one way we do it at Minnesota Public Radio is that oftentimes if um, we'll seed conversations with people from the Public Insight Network, so it sets a tone um, within that conversation. It, it doesn't necessarily preclude people from, um, uh, you know, arguing or, or going off the, the, the subject. Um, but it is awful helpful, especially on, on topics. We do a thing called Today's Question, and um, oftentimes we'll go looking for what we think are unique and thoughtful and, and somewhat unexpected um, um, points of view on that and seed the discussion so that by the time the question goes out in the morning people are sort of already in the frame of mind of, of having a, an intelligent discussion. Um, but I, I also know that uh, recently my old paper, the Salt Lake Tribune, um, considered going to a more moderated um, comments commenting system but engaged the people who were commenting on that subject and their response was, we ignore that stuff. The people who come here to have intelligent conversation have it, and we know there are these other people who are flaming each other and all that. We just ignore them. So um, I'm not sure how much the, you know, I know it's a distraction and a problem. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, I've answered your question. But. There, there are comment moderation systems out there. I don't have the names at the tip of my tongue, but they allow other users to vote up or down questions. They do screening for obscenities and common insults. and. You can set keywords. So there's definitely a science that's emerging. And there's also just a more of a understanding that when you're putting information out there, part of what you have to invest in is then having a conversation with your users. And that's that's creating new roles for journalists as community weavers, as filters, as curators of comments. I, I just wanted to add that um, it was very important to us that young people felt like their voice was being presented in an authentic way, um, even though it's going to be on a public television station, which has a lot of rules and regulations, and probably there will be more um, beyond just leaping out words. Um, so it was important for us to also create, use this digital technology to create other platforms so that, and drive them to those other platforms too. So they can engage in a very authentic way. As a matter of fact, the tag is supposed to be DC Teens Talk, real, raw, and uncensored. They can talk like that, but not on public television. <laughs> so it had to be, we had to create a loop. We had to create a, a way that they can communicate with each other, that they can share information with us. Then we then package for public television, but also have in this other space. Jake, the question for you from Twitter is, where do you find people for the moth? How do you get good stories and not just camera hogs? Oh, sort of, it's actually kind of like one of the yeah. community filtering discussion questions. Well, the, the moth um, does slams. They do story slams, and they do them at bars around New York, and now they're in LA and Detroit and Chicago. And uh, the, they structure the way that you are invited to tell a story, which is meant to be a true story from your life. Um, that you have to get up on stage and tell without notes. You can rehearse it and prepare it and think about it, um, but once you're up there, you've got five minutes, and at the slams, they have, um, from the audience, you, you basically put your name in a hat if you want to tell a story. You don't know if you're gonna get called. Then they have two teams of judges who do Olympic-style scoring, where they have to hold up the cards at the end of that story, so it's actually a pretty dramatic moment, and the winners of that go on to a main stage event. We record all of them and then have editors who go through and choose the ones that might make sense to put on the podcast or the radio show. 
Um, but the Moth staff have really developed an entire approach and methodology around helping people understand what that arc of a story is. And in fact, they, ad they, they actively discourage um, you know, comedians who are going to do their shtick or the writer who's just going to read their essay or somebody who's really just sort of got a, a pitch that they're just going to use. So when you, when you hear the Moth, you really do get a sense that these are authentic stories. Um, I think what's interesting, and just quick related to that, is that what we're, I think, all of us are trying to tease out and have seen bits and pieces of and are starting to cultivate is a, is a different kind of sound and, and vision um, that, that is very differentiated from what we all think of as the core services of PBS and NPR and, and, and the way that that has become established. Um, and, and we see it in bits and pieces in these projects. Um, we've been trying, we, we've created a channel, PRX has called Public Radio Remix, where we're featuring and showcasing the best of what we think of as, as a very different sound that's still very story driven. Um, and I think that's one of the questions is, can you actually start to anchor a new approach to authentic stories um, that make use of the tools that, that, that Linda and others are developing, um, but create an anchor service that actually does draw and have an impact at the level that the national public media um, can do? Um, and it's actually one of the things with Sean, I'm curious about how this is one of those tensions, I think, between cable access and public media, the gatekeeper role, the first come, first serve ethic, and then the sort of question of well-crafted, high impact you know, public broadcasting, like where is, where is there a place where those can meet, where talent really comes forth and you still emerge with something that lots of people want to see and are impacted by? Yeah, that's a good question. Sean, do you have an answer? <laughs> well, uh, th thanks, for the, thanks for the engagement, because I, I do think it's a challenge for public access. I mean, you're basically putting out unfiltered water uh, uh, and saying, you know, help yourself, but it may or may not be drinkable. Um, so I guess the, the, clearly there's a high value to curation and trust and trustworthiness. I mean, we've got authenticity down, <laughs> but <laughs> but curation and you know meaningfulness and relevance and you know we don't. <laughs> so I think that's something that we certainly have been challenged with and looking at. And in a way, I, I know in, in our little case, we we frequently have multiple channels available to us, and so we sort of have the raw stream over here the uh, first come first serve anything goes and then we may have a more curated and then we start looking more like StoryCorps and and some of the things that you're doing and so the net like networking the local radio stations becomes part of that we're, we're obviously there are things they can use and things they can't use but um, but but I do I do think that we, we both have things to offer each other and I think curation and adding sort of an intelligent like like I said I, I watch your stations more than my own so <laughs> So you have some This ties into it. So I'm, I'm thinking about the, this, the tension uh, that, Sean, you're citing of the gatekeepers um, and this, you know, quote, what, what, what some of us represent and have spent most of our lives working in, uh, in developing this sort of mainstream public media. And so um, it's sort of an interesting time because we're obviously at this incredibly transformative moment in, in uh, the mainstream public media that's driven by the technology, but also right now driven by by this financial crisis and all of, of the pressure. So without dwelling on all of it too much, I think it's interesting to understand too, I think that, I, I don't wanna necessarily speak on all of our behalf, but I think it's true that we're really trying to do the same thing in, in terms of returning back to some of the original roots and the original founding vision of what public media was, which was supposed to be this, you know, a broad service to reflect all of America. And I'm lo just looking, I'll read real quickly from the original founding vision statement for National Public Radio will ser serve the individual. It will promote personal growth. It will regard the individual differences among, among men with respect and joy rather than derision and hate. It will celebrate the human experience as infinitely varied rather than vacuous and banal. And it will encourage a sense of active constructive participation rather than apathetic helplessness. And finally, it goes on and on. Um, but the potentials of live interconnection will be exploited. I mean, it's a fantastic vision. And we've had these 40 years of evolution into, again, a mature, biz very successful business. But it sort of brings us, in some ways, back to square one in this. What's that? The vision st or the mission statement? I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> Why don't you both ask your questions, and then we'll have the panel do a final round. Okay, I, um, I'm just curious about funding for the projects that, you know, the really innovative projects that you all are talking about up there and where that funding has come from. Okay. 
Wally Bowen with the Mountain Area Information Network, Asheville, North Carolina. I wanted to commend Sean for uh, emphasizing community-owned infrastructure. That's the only way we're going to be able to uh, uh, circumvent the gatekeepers is by owning our own in infrastructure. So my question is, for the entire panel, uh, what potential do you see existing community media, uh, community radio stations, uh, community TV stations, public access, et cetera, uh, in expanding their roles to become uh, owners and operators of the broadband infrastructure, wireless and fiber? Okay. So I'll start with Carol's um, question. It sounds like Sean will be the second one. But um, funding first. So for PRX's case, we have a mix of funding from philanthropic sources and then direct revenue that we generate by being a distributor. Um, so we are an online marketplace. We take a percentage of transactions. And when we develop mobile applications, there's revenue sources that evolve. But I think that the, and I, think that I know this is common for, for Air too with Maker's Quest. Um, one of the critical pieces of funding that's under great threat is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and in particular, um, a piece of that funding, which has been called the Digital um, Fund, which had been an, essentially added to CPB's budget over a number of years, originally to pay for the transition of television and radio to HD and to digital broadcast. So mostly for years, it was just going to buy the equipment for the transmitters. And in the last three or four years, they've started to free up some of that to go towards content and services. And in an in a industry with very little money for R&D or for innovation funding, that little bit of funding has been essential for projects that we and others have, have done, some experiments that have failed, some others that have really taken root. Um, and it's literally these, these weeks being debated um, whether any of that will remain. Um, and if it goes away, that would be a very big blow to these kinds of forward-looking efforts. So the Public Insight Network is um been underwritten in large part by American Public Media, which is a legacy media company. Um, but also we have uh, foundation funding from really civic-minded um, organizations who are trying to transform journalism and help uh, media organizations transform their relationship with communities. So that would be McCormick, MacArthur, CERDNA. I mean, you've, you've heard all of these uh, uh, organizations mentioned in public media because I think we all are kind of connected in the same circles. And the Knight Foundation, which has been really generous and helped um, underwrite the growth of the Public Insight Network over the last three years. And we do receive um, some funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting most of it is passed through money that we send directly to some local journalism centers around the country that are um, experimenting with the idea of having six or seven public media organizations collaborate on reporting around a single topic area. So really being able to um, go very deep in areas about immigration and agribusiness and environment. And um, so again, I know that uh, you know that's a, a critical thing is that oftentimes we're just passed through to funds for local journalism projects. Okay, last okay. answer, Sean. Okay, um, to the first question, there are two major funding streams that are inadequately tapped. One is, these are public resources, spectrum, compensation for spectrum. There are auctions, there's a huge amount of revenue that just gets sucked right back in to the, uh, meet the debt. This should be rededicated re to us. And in a way, these are assets that public broadcasters have. And I ask my public broadcasting friends, when you are multiplexing your channels, can you set aside some channels for the community, local community <laughs> access? Uh, I think a little bit of, I think a little, I think a little resource sharing would go a long way. And then on the ground, we have public rights of way. That's our land that the telephone wires, the fiber, the cable runs on our property. We need to collect rent for the use of that property for our rights of way. We have two major funding streams that could support us, and that's where cable access comes from, but we're losing it. We need to work together to reclaim the, the compensation for these public resources. Great. All right, well now I'm fired up. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to my panelists and everybody in the audience who contributed. And uh, go out there and reform the media. <laughs>